thanks for for remaining here and now it's time for the round table and, uh, um, and next to me i have three um distinguished scholars um uh, Anne Dewey, helen ken and um and finally we have uh mark long um and we will start a, a debate i think they will start to raise some issues i've been uh, dealt with here during this this uh uh conferences and there, there are a lot of i think there are a lot of there's a lot of material right um, and uh, and i think is that that is you know um, very interesting material that can be uh, the object of of, of debates uh i know uh, that they have been you know writing down nodes and 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 thinking about different topics so now i would like to just uh, give them the floor and and you can start your debate for as soon as you like thank you Okay. Um, yeah, it's been a wonderful two days, really wonderful two days. Um, so I'm going to uh, just, I guess, you know, I guess we're each going to note some themes, connections we've seen over the course of the, of the um, presentations. And I'd encourage you all um, to think of the connections you made so this can really be a round, early round table, <laughs> okay? Um, we've been this and everybody's part of it. And um, think of all those unasked questions that you didn't get to ask in the sessions and maybe we can deal with those too. Okay, so um, I've seen, I guess I've tried to sort of pull together different themes and I certainly see um, we've had a lot of talks connecting the visual and the verbal, um, a lot of work with ekphrasis, with the um, paintings that William's engaged with, and uh, and Levertov as well. I started naming the names of, of the presenters, but it was too many, so I, I, I'm not going to name everybody, but um, yeah, I'm try I hope everybody feels themselves included in this list. Um, so certainly the relationship between the visual and the verbal, uh, very powerful. The social and the political power of the poem was another theme, um, and the role of the poet in society and politics. Um, poetics or politics uh, of the poem implicitly and explicitly expressed. Um, we've had, talked about the politics of content and also the politics of form, the relationship between creation and destruction, um, especially in, in William's poetry. Um, the challenge of representation, the difficulty of representing the marginalized, um, those without voice. Those have been set of another another set of themes. Um, next, I have felt a very poignant sense of the passing of generations in so far as we've had scholars who knew these poets who can tell us anecdotes and um, they're not going to be with us forever. <laughs> and so there's a sense of the, of the passing of generations to those who don't know these poets who will know them through, well, rather through their texts rather than as, um, as individuals or through anecdote, although the archive is always still there too. Um, however, I feel the next generation is really in good hands. I've seen wonderful work from doctoral students here uh, this time. And so we're going to be okay. Um, there were a lot of papers both yesterday and today, fascinating, fascinating analyses of um, the relationship. Um, how, well, I guess, how do images represent things? The tension between uh, concrete image and language, many different interpretations of that particular relationship. Um, the relationship between uh, image, let's see, image language, image and poetic form, um, rupture and flow, nature and craft, all of those dichotomies have come up and people have given them different turns and interpretations. Uh, very interesting relationships uh, in the form. Uh, next, let's see, sorry, I'm a little bit out of order here. <laughs> oh, along with that, there was kind of a, uh, I guess it makes sense, William's, if 200 of his poems were about flowers, but there was a rather, there were rather a lot of interpretations of flowers, which I think were interesting in themselves from kind of resilient species in, in Ellen's presentation to um, eroticized in mind to figures of identity in Rizal <laughs> presentation. Um, so that uh, quite interesting. Uh, we've thought a lot about uh, 
Levertov's relationship to Williams uh, by way of similarity, but also contrast insofar as how does Levertov's um, spiritual poetics, incarnational or, or religious um, poetry, emerge from the influence of Williams? What is the relationship between those two? And also how does Levertov hold her own as, um, and define herself as poet and woman in among a very masculine set of contemporaries and tradition? Um, so those have, those have been themes. And then finally, I think we've seen a really rich, um, European context. The context of this conference being very international, being very European has given us a rich understanding of both poets, um, both as multi-ethnic in themselves and the ways in which that shapes their sense of identity and their poetics and, um, the, the really global or at least, yeah, transatlantic intercontinental Pan-American as well influences on them. Um, so that, and that certainly breaks with any myth of U.S. exceptionalism that one might want to, to bring in. So um, I think I'll stop there. I have a couple other comments about themes we might take up, but I think we'll, we'll go there later, maybe. There's time. Thank you, Anne. Uh, that was wonderful. It's just, let's see if I can do better today with the mic. I hope so. Is that better? Yeah, good. So I loved, I really loved your summary. Um, and a lot of those topics have been on my mind as well. But one thing that I wanted to raise here, um, that kind of made me rethink some of what I said yesterday, um, has to do with this idea of representation that we talked about both in terms of the crosses and in terms of representing the terrible faces of our non-entities. Um, and the power of the poem or the role of the poet in wartime. So it just struck me that there must be some kind of important line where um, as an artist, as a poet, you use the materials available to you and you represent them. But um, as we heard earlier today, um, the representation of these non-entities, so it, it is both a way of valuing and uh, giving a place to marginalized people, but at some point, perhaps it crosses into some kind of exploitation, that there's this kind of really, really difficult line that you have to navigate as a poet, and that that might be even more relevant in war times, um, especially considering the, the comment that uh, Chris uh, gave yesterday as well. Uh, in relation to my talk, um, so I was I was really curious about how that works. Um, this idea of representing the everyday, representing the people who are usually not represented, but at, at the same time, turning this into art, into form, into an object or objectification. And I don't know if I've I, I haven't finished thinking about that, but I think there's something here that is very important and that might be important all the time but i think in wartime that's when you probably see whether or not this is a line that can be crossed or should be crossed and who can cross it if you write about a bombardment should you write about it because you are subject to it because you are suffering from it is that a, a more tenable position from which to write than writing from a safe place where you are not affected which is actually kind of akin to the whole problematic of um, climate crisis and, and, and the environment where there is no longer a safe place. So if you think about the theory of the sublime, it used to be the case that a volcano erupting is beautiful because there's a safe position from which to view it, and then you can turn it into art. But if, you, but if, if we think about... Um, the fact that you can become poisoned by pollution just because you are surrounded by climate and climate change. Is there, is it possible to write about flowers? Like all these questions, I think with beauty, art, and then the real political issues that kind of, that the poet has to tackle, should tackle. But the question is always like how, how to actually cope with that. I don't know. I, I, I think I need to think more about this, but maybe someone else has, uh, some thoughts on that. I think I'll leave. I'll leave for now. Uh, so, thanks, um, and great summary and, and and nice specific, Ellen. Um, so, I've got four 
just general observations. The first one is about the metaphor of confluence. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about Levertov and the poet in the world, and it, it, it seems like these two poets are deeply engaged in ways that other poets might not be in, in, in their various activities, whether it's practicing medicine, um, whether it's um, activism, uh, as well as the practice of poetry. And so I started thinking about confluence, and I started thinking about rivers and tributaries, and I wanted to expand the metaphor to the watershed, because the watershed is, of course, the place where the rivers run. And I'm thinking about uh, geofluvial morphology, if you know what this uh, discipline is, which is the ways in which water carve landscapes and, and create the landscape and the shape of the landscape. And it seemed like there was a neat way of thinking about that metaphor, talking about the poetry in the world, because the watershed contains people, relationships between people, the, the, the complications and the dramas of our lives, right? So it's not just the main rivers. And, it, and it, if you look at the body of the work, and you know, you can roughly break it out in the first and the second half of the 20th century, these are poets of the watershed, is, is the way I might put it. I mean, they, they really, really do um, uh, occupy that larger space. So, so that, that's one observation. And that also leads, of course, to um, little pieces picking up on, on something that matters a lot to me, because I've spent a lot of my professional life thinking about these questions, uh, which, which is um, eco-poetics and the relationship between ecology and poetry. Um, and words like resilience, words like uh, uh, human and post-human materialism, this theoretical discourse has developed in my professional life in extraordinary ways, and uh, it's, it's been really helpful in our understanding about Williams, which used to be really thinking about poetry in place in, in a more, I don't know, restrictive sense of that, although I will point out that Wendell Berry's book on uh, on, on William Carlos Williams is among the best if you want to learn about a, a poetry that is rooted in a particular uh, a particular place. And what I mean by that is an inhabited landscape, uh, n not not just the, the more than human. So the um, that's first. Um, the second uh, was I was thinking a lot um, during the presentations about Williams and Levertov both within but beyond influence. So not just thinking about Williams as the father and, you know, Levertov as the daughter. I think that was brought up. And I think that's a very limiting way to think about the contribution of both of these poets. So, so for me, what's important about both of these poets, and I've, I've tried to talk about this in, in terms of the relationship between Williams and Ammons, um, but the, 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 the word presence, the inescapable presence of both of these poets uh, in, in both the practice of poetry and in poetics. Both of them are just, to me, giants in, in discourse about poetry and about poems. They just, you can come back to them again and again with students, and there's so much there, always, ever, uh, just more than you can ever, uh, ever imagine. And what I mean by this is that, um, so beyond influence is thinking about the ways in which particular poems books of poems, bodies of work, shape the conditions for practice in that medium, in this case, writing poems. So a poem like Patterson is, you, you can't, if you're a poet, you can't really write your way around it. You kind of have to write through it. The same thing could be said about spring and all, which I'll touch on in just a second. So um, anyway, um, both Williams and Levertov, to my mind, and what I heard here, is that they really did change the literary and cultural space in which poems are made. And I think that's one of the reasons we keep talking about them, despite what people might have said in the past. I quoted someone who said, well, why are you even thinking about someone who won't be read in 10 years? Um, well, spring and all, yes. 1923, uh, 2023, sure. Um, but I just struck how many people, Alberto, Belen, Ellen, uh, Leonor, Paul, Antonio, Luis too, uh, brought up, he brought up uh, uh, the, um, 
the Red Wheelbarrow poem, but of course that comes from spring and all. So anyway, the presence of spring and all, it's just an enormously, um, Esther talked about poems as inexhaustible. This is an inexhaustible text and it finds its way in so many conversations and it was here and present for us for a whole conversation this week. I was really struck by that. And by the way, I have a plum. I, I, I was at lunch and Ellen said, oh, are you bringing that? So I have a prop. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it, but I've got it, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then finally, um, uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, used a phrase, I think, uh, meeting across generations. And, and I, I, I like that a lot. I, I think that that's a nice way for us to think about uh, the poetic inheritance of both poets. So this meeting across generations, um, this meeting, of course, there are questions of form. Um, there are questions of literary and historical and cultural inheritance. There are questions of gender. There are so many of these questions keep coming back again and again. And um, finally, um, Esther used the term, uh, the trajectories of each poet. And I was very self-conscious about this. If I isolate uh, Denise Levertov's work in terms of her interest in organic form, because of course, like Ezra Pound said um, about imagism, these are points on the curve of a poet's development. And both Williams and Levertov are remarkable in how their their work grows and changes over time. Um, I, I, it's really difficult to talk about them in a general sense because there are so many ways in which we can approach these poets, and I think that's why we that's why we're here. Um, so there's you know there's no one poem or or poetry or or poetics of Williams or Levertov. There are many, uh, and 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 we keep we keep coming back to them. Um, and, and, you know, this is precisely why we talked a lot about the imagination. And, and I think, uh, one of the phrases that someone used was, um, uh, 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 spring and all is a manifesto of the imagination. Um, and, and I think that, um, that formulation by Williams is one of the reasons why that text continues to, continues to stay with us. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but those are my general observations. All right, thank you very much. And now uh, the session is officially open for debate. So if anyone would like to just weigh in a comment or ask questions, uh, a lot of uh, different uh, topics uh, have been uh, uh, basically uh, and, and exposed here, and I time perhaps for uh, commenting on some of them. You can pick up uh, any of them, um, you, you know, uh, whichever one interests interests you more. Right. So, any any comments? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would just add one more thing. Now that I'm thinking about it, um, is it, is just the 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 point about the um i think transatlantic is the right word and uh, it is i'm i'm currently working on um organizing a, uh, our biennial conference of the william carlos williams society in uh puerto rico in mayugas where his mother uh, was born and um my conversation with the local organizing committee has been extremely stimulating to me and in terms of understanding williams even beyond um, his, um, you know, his Spanish American roots, as they've been called, um, and, and I'm just fascinated by the ways in which Williams gets purchased within literary and cultural traditions, particularly in a comparative sense. And uh, you know, Ellen has written extensively about this, and but but I'm in, really interested in that. And I'd love to hear you all talk more about that to help me to help me learn more about that, about why Williams is present here in that in that sense and i know christina you're you're working on these questions it sounds like which is so interesting to me and i want to hear more yeah thank you very much for your comments and for your um thinking aloud
This is, of course, a work in progress, and I hope that this is the beginning of a line of thought that has always been there, but maybe not made explicit until this conference has happened. Quite often I have heard Williams um, mentioned in relation to Lavertov, Lavertov uh, referring to Williams. This, this dialogue has been there forever, as long as I can remember. Since I started reading on, on Denise Lavertov's poetry and, and poetics, and having the opportunity to have this debate is essential. So I hope that this is just a beginning and uh, it's great um, to be listening to you, Mark, uh, saying that, you know, there is something, there is one possible uh, line of, of collaboration or future research or because I think that by overlapping different perspectives and different approaches, um, we nurture the field. This is how I see it. And uh, you were mentioning this idea, the idea of this legacy or this interest in, in Spanish or Spanish-American culture on William's um, art and, and craft and poetics and, you know, all this power. I think that this similarity, although through, through different paths, can be established with Levertov. And actually it was quite revealing for me, and in this sense I would like to also uh, recall um, the talk given by Professor José Luis Aja just um, in the previous session. He was marvelously explaining to us how um, Williams has been has been received in Spain, mostly in Spain, not in not in South not in South America or Central America, but mostly in Spain through translations. And it was so revealing, so revealing. So what I mean to say with this is I am so interested in this. You, you, you know this. You have uh, heard and you have heard my presentation today. I so I am so interested in this cross uh, crossing of borders, uh, the, the crossing of borders which go uh, beyond. Uh, it, it goes beyond um, time and languages and genres even. And I'm so interested in that, but. This is a, a situation, a situation, because there are so many angles and so many um, so many unknown uh, elements that this is something that needs research and more research. So I just have some ideas, but I know that there are there is so much out there that this is a very rich ter terrain for exploration. So I hope that, um, and the good thing is that I don't know where to start. So this is great. <laughs> so this is great. And I'm open to, uh, to listening to what others have to say, because I know that I will have a very limited view, only what I know. And I'm very much aware of how much I don't know. So I'm just willing to know <laughs> and to learn um, from what others um, in the conference attending the event um, went to say. It's open. So while, while you're thinking in the audience, because I didn't give all of mine away at once, <laughs> I was, um, when you were talking, Christina, I, I was thinking about the marvelous reach, both geographically, generationally, but then in addition, kind of poetically, that these two poets um, together combined cover. Uh, so we have 
we have heard so many different names in conjunction with these poets during these two days. We've talked about A.R. Ammons, we've talked about Duncan, uh, but also Demuth, like painters, poets, and sometimes also poets that would seem to be, if not incompatible, then at least kind of belonging to different types of traditions, especially in the uh, American post-war uh, poetries. So that to me is fascinating how Williams, of course, had this huge network. He was such a, I mean, we often talk about Pound as this great facilitator, which of course he was, but Williams was extremely generous as well with, with writers of the younger generation. But then it seems like Levertov too, is involved in all these different contexts. We can think about her as a Black Mountain poet, which we haven't talked so much about here. And of course, we all know how important Williams was to many of the Black Mountain poets too. Uh, for example, to to uh, well, Quilly and Olson. Um, so it seems to me that we've managed to tie together two poets who combined have this enormous network, this enormous reach. And... Um, it's cross-generational, it's across the arts, it involves many different art forms, especially maybe painting, but we also, we also talked about music, we've talked about dance, uh, Williams writes about dance, we have Levertov, she dances. I find that extraordinary, it's so rich. Um, and then you could say, well, all poets are like that, but they're not, that's not at all true. Some of them are much more reserved, um, whereas these poets seem very, very, very keen on interacting with other poets, other modes, engaging both in the community, but also in the more artistic realm. Um, and here, I guess, painting was the most like explored path, which, of course, Williams himself painted. So, um, But that, to me, is something to really be inspired by. And I think that would open up to an enormous range of potential collaborations and uh, topics for research for future generations as well. So that's one more thing that I want to add into the mix. If someone wants to, I don't know, comment on that. You mentioned the uh, reserved, and, and by the way, in speaking of which, is it reserved? Is it? And I totally, I would totally subscribe. You, you subscribe your words about them, you know, being giants. Uh, you know, they, they their references to painting. Uh, they had a beautiful music. They, they, they loved music. They had an, an excellent, uh, you know, ears for music. Uh, and that obviously uh, is clearly, clearly. Um, manifested in in their poems and in the form of the poems, the measure of the poems, and so, and and that's something I was very much aware of while while I was in, engaged in the translation of of Levitov's work. Uh, the music is it's just it's just uh, it, it, it is something so so uh, amazing. Is is something you want to you you you're working hard because you want to. Uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, find a way, find a way to make the Spanish equivalent uh, musical as well, right? In a certain way, but you want you want you want you listen to that music and you say, "This is uh, this is gorgeous," and you've got to find ways uh, to transpose that. Uh, uh, into the your Spanish uh, version of the poem, but uh, since you mentioned the word uh, reserved, uh, there's something that, that strikes me, and, and and it's something that uh, Professor McCone mentioned it the other day, uh, talking about the correspondence. He said that uh, both Levertov and, and Williams were very careful in their letter in, in their letters that they held a lot back. And I wonder why, 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 why that phenomenon there is. Is there any reason for that? Why, why were they so careful when they were corresponding with each, with it, with each other? Because I don't, I don't have the sense that Levertov was uh, so careful when he, when she corresponded with with Duncan, and and you mentioned that that that, that aspect, and and and, and, I, and I kept wondering myself what would be the the main reason for that, for that, you know, holding 
bad and being reserved and being too so careful about uh, the letters. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. This is on, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's interesting in terms of the correspondence. Um, uh, his his first response when uh, Levertov writes to him is that he pictures himself as a toad in the garden, and um, uh, but he's debilitated, and the, the the letters are going back and forth partly through Flossie, and Flossie is part of the that conversation, and um, the piece of my paper that I left out that um, uh, that the, when he sort of oversteps. It's about the poem Jacob's Ladder, the Jacob's Ladder, uh, and he oversteps and, he's, and he he's, he gets it wrong. And he says, you know, this is uh, iambic pentameter, and and um, she's not just hurt. I, I don't know that she's hurt at all. She's angry. Um, that's not what my poem is about. You're, you're, and but she doesn't know what to do, and she doesn't come. So. Um, so she does a tri triangulation thing, um, and um, it's going to. Um, who does she write to? Um, the Levertov writes to not not um, what's her name, Ruth. Uh, when when William says uh, it's about the Jacob's ladder. Uh, Mary Ellen Salt, Mary Ellen Salt. So she writes to Mary Ellen Salt, and she says, uh, "It's not so much that um, uh, that he's beating a dead horse. The horse is up and running, and the horse is out of control um, uh, because now everybody's thinking about the uh, um, the American idiom. And this is just another generalization about poetics. And she's very." whatever. And then they get back and they reconcile. She writes back that long letter and he writes back and he just says, well, yeah, sorry. Um, but um, other than that, the, there's a, a couple of triangulations that are going on, at least a couple in in the letters. And so there's a, a little bit of a performance in front of other people. And, and Flossie is an important part. Um, um, I also wanted to go back um, to the to the to the um, sunflower poem, and I I do think that our discussions have brought out the importance of flowers in their poems in relation to each other. My take on the sunflower poem to floss um, is kind of that you know the guys had their thing, um, Ginsburg, and uh, they had their sunflower poem. But it's a gift from uh, Denise Levertov to Floss to say, we we had this walk together and we had our sunflowers. It's a very touching moment. Um, just sort of to wrap that little piece up. I think this kind of follows with what Steve is saying. One of the things that interested me was um, Professor Shattuck's talk, because I think one of the subtexts that he wasn't, talking about openly is that poets and artists are compulsive people. They feel that they must, must, must have their say or their, and whatever yeah, motor medium they want to do it in. On the other hand, they're extremely private people. And so, yeah, they'll write an essay about, you know, one thing or another, but they don't really mean what's in the essay. The essay is something that they do because they're expected to explain or to explicate their compulsion. And I think it's really important to remember compulsion because compulsion is the same in all languages. It doesn't matter 
whether you are in Spain or in America or somewhere else in the world, when you feel the need not only to say something, but to make people understand how you mean it and whether you they like it or not, this is how you need to look at the world with me, I think you're at a different um, place than other people are. If I could just intervene quickly on that before, I guess, as the mic makes its way over to Chris. Um, yeah, Denise, uh, we had often talk about other poets, her relationship with other poets, et cetera. And I'd have my nice graduate student theory of, you know, this is theoretically how you're different. And she'd always say, oh, it's a difference of temperament. You know, and so it's once again those two levels. The conscious level of writing about your poetry is very, very different from your understanding of what makes it tick, where it comes from, etc. Um, to 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 address the um, the comment, it, Robert Creeley's comment that they were holding things back. Robert Creeley's comment, and I wasn't there. He said it to New Directions, and they reported it back to me. And um, I think sometimes they do, uh, uh, but I think he he might have expected the kind of correspondence he had with Charles Olson, which what takes up what fourteen volumes before they met, really frank with one another. Also, we should remember that Williams and Levitoff met many times, and we really only have half the relationship here. We have the written one, but what went on in the room in Rutherford, um, then I'm not sure he does hold back in his comments on the poems. I think what he holds back in, if we're going to go with Creeley, is um, responding to her in, uh, deeper personal emotions as a, woman, as a woman, because he had some strange ideas about women, I think, that go right back to uh, the egoist and uh, Weininger and all the, the sort of gender distinctions that they like to make in those times, which I think is why it's safer for him to switch into Sappho um, when she has just mentioned very being very, well, as much as she mentions it, being upset. Um, he's more comfortable there. Um, and uh, she... she it, if she holds back with him and and not with Duncan, it's a very different kind of correspondence with Duncan. You really learn, I think, a lot more about Denise Levitoff reading the Duncan correspondence. Um, it's because he's this, this older figure who she gets a lot from and respects very much, but doesn't want to respect so much that she has to take everything he says. So it's a very delicate balance, which is why I thought it was interesting to analyze that letter which I'm sure she spent a lot of time thinking about, um, beginning with an apology that isn't really something she did, which is not having written all summer when she wrote in July, and that starts it off. While I have the microphone, could I just say a couple of other things about... Um, one thing I thought was the things we haven't been able to cover in the conference, because we only have two days, um, the poets that Levitov didn't have any sympathy for, and Louis Zukovsky is one of them, she a number of times is very annoyed with him for being so obscure, and she's not. it's not what she thinks poetry should be about, and that's the difference between her and Williams. And she wasn't too keen on Ginsberg's poetry. She uh, liked him as a person, thought he was very generous, um, but didn't want to write that kind of poetry. Robert Lowell, as she initially admired, but then had a falling out with, and he had one with her. And, and I think he's very patriarchal and not at all, uh, didn't write the kind of poetry or was the kind of person she uh, felt sympathy with. Uh, Auden, I don't recall, he comes up very much. Is, is there something I didn't notice? But, I mean, he was a real presence still in the 50s. Um, Elizabeth Bishop? I don't think so. Um, so that, that's one, that one thing we could think about with the Levitoff. Then there's Muriel Rukeyser, who's hardly come up, and she might have helped us 
think about poetry and war because that's something she takes on too. And of course, they both agree to go to North Vietnam and everything that involves. Then I was thinking about poetry and war. And I mentioned to you, Ellen, that it occurred to me yesterday after talking about William's bombardment poem that I thought was insensitive, that HD manages to pull it off in the, the walls. The walls do not fall, do I have the title right? Where she actually talks about the bombing in London she's there of course and that gives an, uh, an authority to what she's writing uh, but also th there's a mythical element to it which doesn't deny the um the, the horror of the bombing but it does um th there's a larger purpose to it whereas williams it's um they will they're knocking down the slums that's a good thing something better will come out of it which wasn't very nice for pe uh, people like my grandmother who lived in one of those slums and lost her house. Um, and then I was thinking about other poets which it seemed to me successfully write about war. And I thought of Wilfred Owen, it seems to be the first world war poet who's lasted. And it's, it's because he combines those romantic terms with the very real experience of war. And so again, there's a there's a kind of mitigation of the horror which he doesn't deny at all by the kind of romantic terms that Yeats hated him using, and thus wouldn't publish him in his collected poems. But I think that's why he's last lasted. And then um, Auden again, along with Williams, Auden um, wouldn't publish his poem about uh, the beginning of the Second World War. I mean, originally he published it, then he wouldn't collect it. Um, and I think uh, I think that's because there wasn't a larger purpose. And that might be what H.D. and uh, uh, Owen have in common, that they're writing war poetry to try and get beyond war, against war. And Auden is kind of indulging himself, I think, in September 1st, 1939. That's the poem, isn't it, that, about, about the war? And Williams is indulging himself, I think, too. Exploitation. I've been thinking about ever since you mentioned it, and I think we'd have very little art if we denied exploitation. It's such a difficult line, isn't it? Poets, writers, artists use their experience of the other, and the other is sometimes not consulted. And sometimes we might be glad. I mean, is Guernica exploitation? Of the Spanish Civil War, but aren't we glad we have Guernica, but we're sorry we have the Spanish Civil War. I th think that's my two cents. Um, just about war, um, more poems and more um, poetry about wars. Um, so for uh, Williams, um, Levertov, Ginsburg, um, it, although there's a moment when um, when Levertov actually goes to North Vietnam and during um, an intense uh, period of combat, um, it, war is mediated. And even Auden, I think, comes to the United States before um, you know, um, and and looks back on as as another uh, number of other right, British writers came to the United States at the same time. So they're writing about war as a, a mediated kind of thing, and they're not combatants. They they have investments. Um, um, uh, Williams has an investment in terms of his son as uh, being in the Navy, et cetera. But um, yeah, so I would, I think that has something to do with it. Yeah. Um, okay. No, I was just, I was thinking about that also, um, the, having experienced war bombardment of some kind directly to, um, in terms of Ellen's ear comment at the beginning to go back to, you know, having no safe place to, 
write from. And with Levertov, it just brought so many poems to mind from listening to Distant Guns, you know, in her first collection where she's hearing the boom of the guns, where she is as peaceful, but she hears that two ones, like, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the woman who's in the jungle and her husband's been killed far away, but she doesn't know it yet. That kind of something's happening, but you don't know it yet. You're aware that oh, far away, you're vulnerable in a way that, but you're not able to experience it at the moment. Um, silent scream. There are just a lot of poems. And so it made me realize, do you think she writes, um, already with that sense of no safe place to write from. And then I was going to ask Mark whether you thought that applied to Williams or not, because he's so connected when he's writing. Um, but I don't, as far as I know, he hasn't experienced war close up. So I don't know if it would come situationally from war or from whatever. Anyway, I thought I'd bring it from his echo, po po echo poetical, perhaps, um, sense of the interconnection of things. Um, well, Question for both of you, each of you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, war is the only thing today. Uh, is that from um, uh, 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 not Poetry's Field of Action? It's um, <clears throat> Help Me, Chris. No, it's not. It's um, I'll think of it in just a second. It's it's one of his essays. Anyway, he opens with that, and and um, but but no, I think directly, but 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 he's implicating the writing of poetry in the cultural and historical moment and the conflict of the Second World War. Yeah, um, uh, that he's kind of directly connected with all of these things that are happening far away indirect maybe would yeah well, well but the poet is always implicated i guess in what he's saying um and i'm just blanking on the name of the essay Sorry, i didn't quite, quite catch the quote what was the quote war is the only thing today it's the gosh i'm just uh i'm tired it's not the beginning of the book it's not the, yeah, anyway I, um, okay, let's see if I can say something. I'm also, I'm also getting a bit tired. Um, when you talk about Williams and war and being implicated in all, or, or directly um, engaged or affected, I started thinking about, because I've written um, so much about Williams in Europe, and m many, well, some of the wars have been in Europe, some haven't, but uh, when it came to the First World War, um, he does explore this idea of, you know, and um, the anti-German um, sentiment um, there, the first or not through the second, uh, as an, a thing that shows you how war extends or expands beyond the actual conflict zone or zone of conflict to, especially in a place like the United States with such a it's such a, a diverse population, how these things actually reach far beyond and affect people that aren't actually there, but they affect them in other ways, not naturally, the kinds that we saw with, with HD uh, or, or Owen. Uh, it's not the same at all, but it's, it's still a presence somehow that you can't really, you know, close your eyes to or, or get away from. Yeah. Both have produced the argument. Bert Hatlin used to argue uh, that the National Poetry Foundation man in Maine that Patterson was a war poet, mm -hmm. and he made that argument a number of times. Um, and it is written around the time of the war. And I'm reminded his son was out at war. But uh, the nuclear bomb comes up, the gathering of the people at Princeton to, we've seen some of it in the Oppenheimer film came out recently. It does arguably sort of an undercurrent of, of um, violence there. I mean, there's some explicit violence. But um, I, I, I never found it a convincing argument, but I thought I'd throw that out, that 
Hetland seemed to think a case could be made uh, that it that it was a war poem. Any takers What's for that? What's the definition of a war poem? Should we start there? <laughs> And, and I guess there I was thinking also of writing from a position of kind of awareness of your vulnerability versus not writing from, you know, and who knows how vulnerable he, he felt. But that was, I guess, the distinction I was wondering about. So for, for Williams in the Second World War, the war is constantly going to be present through the radio. Um, and even in the descent, um, there's war language in there, inhabited by hordes previously and unrealized, etc. So, um, it, right in that central section of the descent, it's about um, it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Any more comments? Well, I think we, we, um, we've reached the end of our uh, debate or our round table. Thanks a lot for, for your comments. Uh, now it's, it's uh, thanks a lot for, for your insights and for uh, basically uh, bringing up all those different themes that uh, the sitter uh, has very well uh, summarized the main the main or in, in a very uh, faithful way have clearly uh, reproduced some of the main debates here some of the main lectures and some of the main comments that have been made here right? and they open up new new paths of you know for future research on on williams and and Labertov on the confidences uh, between both of them and beyond uh, uh, thank you very much thanks a lot could I, could I just make a quick comment, um, just in the spirit of future collaborations? Um, so uh, the Williams Society, William Cross Williams Society, has a, a website, and uh, this past year, past couple of years, my son and I worked on building a digital concordance to the works of William Cross Williams. So it includes all three collections, the two collected poems and um, Patterson, but it also includes all of Williams's translations from the Spanish, John, John Cohen's uh, edited um, uh, by word of mouth is the title. So I, it would be really useful, I think, um, uh, particularly for students doing work on Williams. And I'm happy to share the link to that, but it's on the Williams Society website. I think it might be useful for our, our future collaborations. It's great. Thank you. Thanks very much.